Well, stay on your feet for just one second. We've been praising him all night. Can you do me one more favor so that I know it's not about me at all, and I know it's not about you at all. It's not about your neighbor. It's not about anybody else. It's all about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the name that's above every name. Come on, give Jesus your best praise in this place. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I'll let you sit down now. Pastor Daryl called me at 1 o'clock. He texted me. Say, can you talk? I said, sure. Anytime Pastor Daryl texts, you know, you, yeah, you stop everything you're doing, and, and I can talk. And uh, he said he needed five minutes, and he said, um, what are you doing tonight? I said, well, my wife and I just bought a new house yesterday, and we got big plans to put the kids to bed, eat some Chinese takeout, and unpack some boxes. And I said, please tell me you got something better that I might be able to do. I mean, I love my wife. I love Chinese takeout, but I don't want to unpack boxes tonight. And he told me everything with Pastor Albert, and I said, Pastor, I would be honored to be here and, and preach tonight. Um, can I call my wife and ask permission? <laughs> and so I called my wife, and she said, of course, of course, I'll wait, and we'll unpack boxes tomorrow. I said, no, honey, it's, it's fine, it's fine. So Pastor Daryl, Kara, what an honor, what an absolute honor to be here tonight. I feel like the journey is, is my second home. Anytime I get a chance to be here, I'm just from, from Jacksonville, Florida, and, and, and I'm, I'm from the west side of Jacksonville, Florida, so like, we're like cousins of Yuli, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> we're all rednecks, we're all, you know, I, I ain't gonna put y'all in the same category as me, but you is, and so... It's so good to be here. I want to give a shout out to my wife. I think she's watching online. She is trying to probably put together bed our three kids right now um, and unpack some boxes, hopefully. And uh, oh, and she's preaching for me this Sunday, so she's writing a message for that as well. She's incredible. I love you, babe. You are incredible. Wait up for me. We all unpack, unpack some boxes together. Man. I feel blessed to be here. Uh, I hope, do you feel blessed to be here tonight? Do you, do, you, do you know what a blessing this church is? Not every church is like this. This is a gift from God um, to you in this area. Why don't you go ahead and turn to your neighbor and tell them you're blessed. And then, and then tell, them, tell them you're blessed because you're sitting by me. Now... Now, I told you that, that I'm, I'm from, from the west side of Jax. I'm, I'm, I'm not really a country boy, but I, I, I got country in me. Like, that's just who I am. I grew up just kind of a uh, blue-collar family, worked really hard. And um, I, I, I kind of grew up, you know, and, and watching wrestling. And, and I brought my revival socks tonight, and, and I wanted to share them with you. I don't know if the camera can get, get these really good. If you know who this is, just, you'll know exactly what to do. This, Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the nature boy, Ric Flair, okay? If you don't know who that is, I believe this altar is for repentance and prayer. And you ain't true redneck if you don't know who Ric Flair is. I want to I wanna preach to you tonight on something that God laid on my heart. I preached this to my church, and, and when I was praying through tonight, God, God showed me exactly where, where to go tonight. And, and I'm so thrilled to be here. About six years ago, uh, I was starting our church, honestly, and, and everything was going well. And I looked at my hand one day, my, my right hand. I don't know if you can zoom in on this and, and, and can really see this. But I looked at my hand, and I've always been kind of a tanned-skinned dude. You know what I'm saying? Where are all my pale people in the house? Anybody like you just pale and you own it? Like the sun comes out and you're like, ah! You know, like... And you know, like tan fat looks better than pale fat and, and, and everything. And, and on this right hand right here, this, this, this small little white dot appeared on my hand. And I didn't really think anything about it until, until a second small white dot appeared on my hand. And a third. And, and then they, they, they thought that, hey, let's get together and have some fun together. And, and, they, and they started to spread. And then, and then it wasn't just on this hand. It, it popped up on, on this hand. And then it wasn't just on, on this wrist. It popped up on, on this wrist. And, and, and finally, I was like, you know, I probably should go to a dermatologist and, and, and just make sure nothing's wrong with me. And, and you know what I'm saying? Like, I just want to, I got little kids, you know. I got a church. I got a wife. Like, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm okay, you know. And, 
I shake people's hands at my church all the time, and I can see them glance down, and, and they'll look at it, you know, like they're not going to say anything because they're adults, you know. But when, when you talk to kids, like they don't care, you know, like kids will walk up, what's wrong with your hand? You know what I mean? Oh, nothing. Like it works great. I had, a, I had a 10 year old walk up to me one day. He's like, What's wrong with your hand? I said, Come here, buddy. I'm dying, okay? <laughs> Thanks for it. I'm just. And so I go to the dermatologist and I just say, Doc, like, what's, what's wrong with me? Like, what is it? And she was like, You have an autoimmune disease called vitiligo, vitiligo, however you want to pronounce it. It's what Michael Jackson had. Um, and Michael Jackson, if you don't know who he is, uh, good Lord, get down here right now and, and get some prayer. And. And he had it, you know, and he was an African-American uh, brother, and, uh, and, and it started growing on his skin, so it was a little more apparent. That's why he ended up bleaching his entire skin. And, and Journey Church, like, if this thing starts getting worse and revival comes around next year and somebody's flight gets canceled, Pastor Daryl, y'all might see a really white brother up here uh, <laughs> just bleach my whole skin. And, and, and I just said, like, is anything wrong with me? She's like, no, you're fine. Actually, the problem is that your white blood cells in your body are fighting too hard. Um, so, so when you get sick or when infection kind of sets in, your white blood cells are fighting and they burst through the pigmentation of your skin and they turn your skin this different color. And I said, well, that's weird. Can you do anything to stop it? And she said, no. And I said, so you're telling me that it's going to grow? And she said, probably, but you never know. We can, there's, there's just no way uh, of telling. And I said, well, why do I have it in different parts? She said, it mirrors itself. So you have it on this hand, you have it on this hand, you have it on this wrist, you get it on this wrist, I have it on this elbow, I get it on this I'm not going to tell you where else I got it, okay? Y'all don't need to know that. I don't know you like that. We ain't that close yet. Maybe next year. We'll see. And so for the longest time when it was growing, I found myself often putting my hands in my pocket. Because I was embarrassed of it. I, I didn't really want anybody to know about it. And, and maybe you got something. Maybe it's a birthmark or something. that you're, you're bald and you wear hats all the time. And I can say that because I'm going bald like it's happening. I'm embracing it. And, and, and so I just something I was embarrassed of. And, 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 and then my 10-year-old son, actually he was 8 at the time because this has been going on for a while. And he looked at me and he's got a tender heart in moments. And he said... Dad, I think, I think it's really unique what you have. And I said, well, why do you say that, buddy? He goes, because not very many people have it. So you're kind of like, you know, original and, and, and one of a kind. And I was like, well, you know, that's a really cool way of, of thinking about it. And then, and then the doctor had told me that um, she said, she actually asked me, hey, do you get sick often? And I said, no, I'm, I'm kind of healthy. She said, it's because your white blood cells are, are constantly fighting in your body. And, and I've been pastoring my church now for six years, haven't missed a single Sunday due to sickness. And I shared this in my church a couple of months back. I got sick on Saturday this week, and they were all like, you shouldn't have said that. But I was in the pulpit on Sunday. Come on, somebody, because of this right here. Superpower, you know. And I had a, like a mindset shift of, of what I used to think about this, and I started to look at it differently. Here, here's what I came to share with somebody in this place today. I, I want you to look at your relationship with Jesus a little bit differently tonight. And I want to talk to a couple different groups of people. I want to talk to the first group of people that, um, honestly, and, 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 and you would be honest because you're in church, and, 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 and I get that, and, and you're here, but, but you really don't want anything to do with God. Like, God, you know God, you know that he loves you, but your life really isn't following after him, and you really don't want it to. And then some of you are in this place, and, and yeah, you love God, and, and he's there, but you're kind of just, you're just kind of coasting through Christianity, and, and, and the fire is just not there, and, and, and maybe you see other people up here, and they're lifting their hands in the air, and when, you know, when I was younger and I saw people lifting their hands in the air, I thought, this is the inappropriate time to ask a question. You need to put your hand down and wait till everything is over, uh, but, but, but maybe you look on and you see people that are just kind of giving God some, some praise in a different way than you are, and, and maybe you're just not there yet, and you you can't necessarily praise a God that you don't know. And then there's some of you in here that God has lit a fire in your heart. And maybe it started at this revival. Maybe it's been going on for a year or two or maybe since you started coming to the Journey Church. And I, I, I want you just to kind of look at your own Christianity today, your own path of following after Jesus because you're the only one that knows where you are on that path. And I want you to look at it in maybe a different way today. 
I want to preach from my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. I don't know if you're allowed to have a favorite since it's all from God, but I got a favorite, so I'm going to preach from it. And it's in Luke 15, but before we jump in, I know in a crowd this size that we might not be on the same page. I know it's revival, and so we all know the Bible. Let me give you a little quick Bible history lesson. God made the world. He created the world out of nothing. He made Adam and Eve, put them in the garden in perfection, and they messed it up. How did they mess it up? I don't know. They had everything that they wanted. They had no cares. They had no worries. They had no problems. They had no kids. They had no clothes. Come on, somebody. How do you mess that up? But they did. As a result, sin enters the world. Every single person that's been born since that moment on has a problem on the inside of them called sin. God vanilla iced that thing and said, if there's a problem, yo, I'll solve it. If you don't know who he is, I can't help you. I have referenced three great people. Get with it. God looked down and said, that's a problem. They can't do anything about it. Every religion on this planet is man trying to get to their God. That's what separates Christianity. Man can't get to our God. So our God came to man. Can I get a better amen? And so Jesus comes and he lives and he dies and he's buried. And he resurrects, defeating sin, death, and the grave all for you. All for me because he loves us and he made a way for our relationship with God to be restored that we were separated with God because of our sin and Jesus died for that so that we could become part of the family sons and daughters of God and in Luke 15 Jesus is telling a story and let me just set it up a little bit because you need to know where what, what's taking place who Jesus is telling these stories to the Bible says in the beginning of Luke 15 that Jesus is eating and hanging out with some of the worst sinners in the town and so Jesus is around sinners which I love that sinners love being around Jesus and Jesus loved being around sinners but then there was this outer circle of Pharisees that were looking on in judgment going man if he only knew doesn't he realize who he's hanging out with doesn't he realize who he's talking to? And Jesus knew what was going on in their heart. And so he told them three stories. One of a lost sheep, one of a lost coin, and one of a lost son. The story of the lost sheep goes like this, that there was a shepherd that had 100 sheep, and 99 of them did exactly what they were supposed to do. They stayed where the shepherd told them to stay. They went where he told them to win, and they did exactly what they were supposed to do. But there was this one sheep that made some really bad decisions. Pastor Darrell, I worked on that the entire drive here, <laughs> and I killed it. And the sheep wanders off. Now, if I'm the shepherd, I'm looking at the 99 going, eh, not bad. My student's over here, right? Some of y'all ain't seen a 99 on a test grade in a long time. <laughs> be like, Lord, parents, some of y'all ain't seen a 99 on their test grades in a long time. I'd be like, I'll take a 99. And I, and, and, and I could respect the shepherd if he just said, 99, that ain't bad. I got three kids. My wife and I uh, used to have two for the longest time. Then that third one came along. We were unpacking some boxes, and, you know, next thing you know, you know. <laughs> and, so, and so on any given day, I got one set of eyes on one kid. She's got one set of eyes on another kid, and we have no clue where the third kid is. I look at her and go, two out of three ain't bad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Shepard could have looked on and said, 99 out of 100, that ain't bad, but... He said, hey, y'all stay here. I'm going to go after the one that's lost. That's the heart of the Father. That is the heart of the Father. It has to be the heart of our churches. Hey, we're grateful for every person that's walked through these doors right here during this revival, during the church, during every other church in this area. Come on, God, thank you for every life that has been changed. But your eyes, Father, are always locked in on the one who is still lost, who is still hurting, who is still broken and doesn't know the amazing love of Jesus that can change their life forever. And so that shepherd goes after that one lost sheep. He finds it. He doesn't scold him. He doesn't yell at him. He throws it on his shoulders, bring it back, and then he throws a party. Celebrates because the lost sheep came home. Jesus goes on to tell a second story. And he tells a story of a lost a woman who lost a coin. Now, this woman, the Bible doesn't tell us this. You gotta read into this, you gotta study, you gotta be a pastor like me that looks into the Greek and the Hebrew and, and really dives into this. This woman, she was like a Yuli woman, you know what I'm saying? Like she 
she was a redneck, okay? And the reason we know this is because when she lost the coin, she lost her mind, okay? And she turned her house upside down, flipping over chairs and couches and everything. And when she found the coin, this is how we know she was from Yuli, she yelled to the entire town, Hey, y'all! I don't found my coin! Y'all get over here, we're going to throw a party! And they celebrate. And that's to show the length that God would not go for you. Some of you are only here tonight because you have a friend in your life that would not stop inviting you to bring you here. They actually went and picked you up. They promised you dinner. It's only going to be crystals, but they're going to get you dinner. Somebody's like, what's wrong with crystals? Nothing. (laughs) And I hope that you're grateful for friends like that. I hope that you're grateful that God put those friends in your life that will do whatever it takes because they don't just care about your life here on this earth. They care about your eternity. And so these two stories would have sent these Pharisees over the edge. And Jesus is about to tell them a third story that's about to just drive them crazy because he tells the story of this lost son. And the story goes like this. And if you've grown up in church, you probably heard it. So let me just give you a refresher course that there was a father that had two sons and the younger son comes up to the dad one day and says, hey, dad, I know one day you're going to die. And when you die, I know I'm going to get a lot of money. But dad, I don't want to wait for you to die to get the money. I want the money right now. Almost as if he was saying to his dad, I wish you were dead right now. Now, how many dads in the house know that boy should have got a good butt whooping? Come on. I'm going to pull all my west side out on him. Instead, the father gives him his inheritance. And the Bible says that the young son goes and spends it however he wants it. And he lives it up. And he gets the house. And he gets the car. And he gets the clothes. And he has it all. Until he loses it all. Until he has nothing. I don't know about you, but I found that sometimes the thing I think I wanted isn't the thing that I really need. And let me talk to the students in the house since y'all are in here tonight. And this goes for any other person in the room, too. Yeah, he might look handsome, but he treats women like garbage. And the thing you think you want in him is not what you need. There is something better. Can I get a high-pitched amen? Amen. Let's flip the script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's really pretty. I get it. Like, yeah, smoking. I I get it. But she's not loyal. And she ain't faithful. Yeah, but she told me that she loved me and that he, you know, no, no, no. She's going to do the same thing. Let's make this applicable for everybody. Yeah, that box of a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts looks real good. (laughs) Especially when it's hot. Come on, somebody. It looks so good. Yeah. Spirit of God is here. But how many of you know hot now means fat later? (laughs) Come on, the thing you think you want is not always what you need. Revival starts when you realize the thing you think you wanted is not what you needed. And revival takes place in your life when you realize the thing that you need isn't a something, it's a someone. His name is, say it with me, Jesus. He is everything that you need. And what I love about this, this young boy is that uh, he, he loses it all. And, and he finds himself in a place where the only job he can get is feeding pigs. Now this would have sent the crowd crazy because they're Jewish and Jesus is Jewish. And they weren't like us from the west side in Yuli. They weren't living that hashtag pig life where they're living off of ham and pork and bacon. Come on, somebody. And so when Jesus says that he's, he's feeding pigs, they're like, whoa. Now I want you to think about this young man. He is feeding something that can't even feed him back. I have found in my own life personally that I have pursued things that I thought would fulfill me. They just left me more empty. 17 years old, 
had everything going for me as a 17 year old like what worries do you have to worry about my parents my dad wasn't the greatest guy in the world but he was pretty solid my mom was incredible she was the glue that kept everything together I had an older brother that had a love-hate relationship with him everything was pretty good <laughs> had a girlfriend at the time she was nice like everything was good like like I had a good life I can't explain what happened in me though I would call it now looking back a mild state of depression and I know that some people look on at a word like that, but come on, it's the real deal. And some of y'all in here are facing some heavy depression. What I was going with wasn't, it wasn't heavy, it was just mild. Like I just wasn't happy. I just felt empty. And, and, and I was kind of in church, and my parents were kind of in church, and, and I'd heard about the love of God, and I knew that Jesus died on the cross for me, but it wasn't something that I was living out. It wasn't something that I really wanted, because I was just doing my own thing. Whatever brought me happiness, whatever brought me some, some satisfaction, I'd just pursue that. And if I didn't get it from that, I'd just move on to something else. And at 17 years old, I found myself in, in my bedroom of my parents' house. They still live there. I go to that room often, and I found myself kneeling down. And I just prayed this prayer, God, if you're real, would you show me? Because there's got to be more than what I'm experiencing right now in this life. And I can't explain it. Because I'd heard about the love of God before, but for the very first time ever, I knew without a doubt that God loved me. I didn't have to earn it. I didn't have to try to get it. I sure didn't deserve it. But he poured his love out on me. And I looked back at God and I prayed this, God, if you love me with everything that I've done, if you're telling me that you're going to love me through all of that, then I will follow you for the rest of my life. I will give you my life, God. And I don't know, young person in the house tonight or adult, if you find yourself in a place where you just feel empty and you look on on nights like this and go, what do they have that I don't have? I'm telling you, it's a thriving relationship with Jesus that is possible because he loves you, because he cares, and he, he wants to be close. So this young son, he's feeding pigs and he has this moment this, this moment, this, this revelation where Luke 15, verse 17, the very first phrase says, when he came to his senses. That's kind of my prayer for somebody in this place tonight, that you would come to your senses. Now, before we read on, I want to tell you a story. And, and when I tell you this story, you're going to think it's just a preacher story. Like, you made this up. You found this thing on the Internet. Nah, this thing's the real deal. This is one of my favorite stories that has ever happened to me in the history of my life. It took place about 10 years ago when my wife was pregnant with our firstborn. It was around Christmas time. We were meeting up with some friends on a Saturday morning. We were going to go out Christmas shopping together, eat lunch, and just have a good time. They were all coming to our house. We lived next door to the church that I was on staff at. Come on, church house. They gave it to me for free right when I got married. Praise the Lord. Couldn't afford nothing. And I hear a knock on the back door, and I was upstairs getting ready, and my wife says, hey, I think it's so-and-so. And so I went down, and right when I was about to open the door, I heard this loud, boo, boo, boo. I was like, well, dang, I'm coming. And we had some, it was an old, really old antique door. It was in like historic Riverside of Jacksonville. And this door was probably from like the early 1800s. This thing was old, had bl little blinds on it. And so I peeked out and I was like, I don't recognize that guy. And right when I peeked the blinds open, he hit the window one more time, boom, and yelled, let me in. To which I yelled back, no. Slammed on it, boo, boo, boo. I said, babe, some guy wants to come into our house. I'm not letting him in, but I think he's going to knock this door down. Like, he is banging on it so hard. It was an old door, and she's pregnant at the time. And I told you I'm full west side, but y'all are about to judge me. I don't carry, like, I don't have any guns. I know, judge all you want. So I grabbed whatever weapon I could find in my house, a lamp. I was, Pastor, I was about to clue that thing up, man. Adam Peterson in the dining room with the lamp. You know what I'm saying? Y'all don't know nothing about clue, please. 
And so we were trying to work together a game plan or what we were going to do. He's banging on the back door. I said, man, let's just run out the front door and run over to the church over here. He won't even see us. About the time that I said that, I heard a boom. And I looked at my wife and I said, he just knocked in the door. I ran out of there. I left my wife in the house pregnant with our firstborn. I don't feel good about it, church. I'm just being honest with you. I was gone, and I looked back, I said, oh, babe, baby, go, come here, come here, come here. And we ran, I didn't even close the front door behind me. We just ran out of there as fast as possible. Turns out one of my friends was already at the church. She was watching the whole thing. My wife had called her, said he didn't knock down the back door, but he walked around to the front of the house. I said, crap. And I said, I said, I said, man. <laughs> man. <laughs> I didn't close the door. So we called the cops. Cops show up and, you know, tell them the whole story. And I said, man, he walked around to the front of my house. I left the door wide open. My wife did. I was, I was, uh, I had a lamp in my hand. I couldn't close it, you know, like. He said, well, I'll go in there. And he goes in and he pulled, he's got his gun in his hand. And I hear him yell, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, and I was following him, and he was like, what are you doing? I was like, I've never seen somebody get shot. Like, <laughs> I want to see it. And he's like, you can't come in here. So I backed up, and I was peeking in, and I watched him. He put the gun away. And, and then he yelled, sir, sir. And then the next thing I heard was boom, boom, boom. Here's how it went down. When he said, sir. The guy, oh, I didn't tell you this, he was passed out on my couch. No clothes on. <laughs> yeah, my couch. When he, when he woke up, he started swinging at the cop. The cop pulled out the taser and tased him on my couch when he stood up. And, and when he did, he flung himself. He hit my coffee table. I told you it was Christmas time. We had the nativity set up. Baby Jesus goes flying across the living room. Angel's wings are broken. It's all chaos. Guy comes walking out with some clothes on with taser still attached to him. And fire trucks show up like just madhouse at my house. I go in there and I see his clothes sitting there and I hand them to a cop and the cop's like, hey, can you give them to him? I was like, no, I'm not giving him his clothes. You give him his clothes. And he's like, no, you're fine. Just go open the door, give it to him. So I walk over there like I'm undercover, like, hey, I'm going to give him his clothes. Here you go, sir. He must have recognized me because the first words he said to me were, hey, man, I'm so sorry. I think I'm at the wrong house. <laughs> yeah. To which I say, man, I'm so sorry too, man. You just got tased. <laughs> and, and what I thought about that story is so crazy is that, man, this guy literally was, was so intoxicated by something that he, he swore he was at my house. But as soon as that taser hit him, it woke him up. It woke him up, and he realized exactly where he was. Man, I'm praying that somebody tonight gets tased by God in the best way possible. That you wake up and you realize that what God has for you is better than anything you could try to get on your own. And so this young man comes to his senses, the Bible says, and he says these words, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. Now you got to remember, Jesus is telling this story to a group of people. And so they're thinking right now, oh dang, it's about to be on. This dad is about to whoop his but come on, I had a dad that didn't believe in timeout. He believed in take you out. Anybody got one like that? Yeah, praise the Lord. And so they're like, how's the, how's the dad gonna, gonna respond? And Jesus says something that really blows him away. Verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, the boy, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. Now, if you're the younger son, 
you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, this is getting off to a better start than I thought it would. My dad's hugging me. He's running to me. He's kissing me. Ah, oh, I, got, I got my speech. I'm going to pull my speech out. Uh, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the dad's like, no, 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 be quiet, be quiet. And he yells to one of the servants, hey, get over here. Get over, come on. My boy's here. My son came home. And he says to the servant, go get the Gucci robe. Put it on my boy. Go get the most blinged out ring we got and put it on his finger. Go get the new Jordans, man. Put them on my son. This is why. Verse 24, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Did the dad wait to celebrate? Did he say, you need to think about what you've done? No, immediately they began to celebrate. This is the love of the Father. He's not looking at you tonight going, hey, you need to wait a couple more days. I know you came to revival tonight, but you need to wait until tomorrow night. Then I'll love you again. No, immediately. Immediately. This makes no sense. The only one in his right mind that's thinking right in this story is the older brother who's been working out in the field all day long, who shows up on the scene and he hears music and he sees dancing and he hears laughter and he's like, what is going on? He grabs one of the servants. The servant says, oh, you didn't hear? Your younger brother came home and your dad's throwing a party. The older brother got ticked. He said, come on, are you kidding me? He's throwing a party for him? I'm not even going in there. Tell my dad to come out here and talk to me. So the dad comes out to talk to the older brother and the older brother you know, this isn't in the Bible, but you got to read into this stuff sometimes. And so I like to pretend like conversations that, that went down. And in my mind, I like to think that the older brother looks at the dad and says, Dad, what the heck? You're throwing him a party? Dad, he wasted all of your money. Dad, do you, you remember what he did? You should be throwing a party for me, Dad. I've been here the whole time. We should be dancing. We should be having a good time, and he should be sitting over in the corner watching us. To which I like to think the father responds by saying, nobody puts baby in the corner. <laughs> and you don't get that, that's just dirty, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Four pop culture references, that's, that's all I got, okay? <laughs> and the father responds by saying the exact same words that he said to the serpent earlier in verse 32. Hey, we had to celebrate and be glad. Like we didn't have a choice. We had to do it. Because your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. Translation, hey, your brother came home. Your brother, do you remember how I used to sit on the porch waiting for him to come home? You remember how I used to talk to you about, man, I wish your brother would come home. Remember how you used to see me crying, crying tears that your brother would just come home. Now that he's come home, we have no other choice. We have to celebrate. And, and I just came to tell somebody here tonight that God wants to throw a party tonight. He's ready to celebrate on your behalf because he wants you to come home. And in the chapter of Luke 15, after each of the three stories, the Bible tells us this. Jesus says these words that when one sinner repents and comes back to God, that all of heaven throws a party. All of heaven rejoices over one sinner. And I have to believe in a room this size that there might be one person that would say, that's me, man. I am far from God. I didn't even think I could come home or I didn't want to come home. But now I'm realiz realizing that everything I've been pursuing has left me more empty and more empty and more empty. And I want something that satisfies me. I think a lot of people look on at Christianity and they think it's something that you have to give up. It's not about what you're giving up. It's about everything that you get. I got more joy in my life. I got more hope in my life. I got more purpose in my life than I ever have before. And the first step of revival is repentance. And repentance is this word that we use in church that some people don't like and some people don't understand. It's as easy as this. You're going one direction away from God and it's you coming to your senses. You getting tased and you saying, man, I want to turn from everything that I'm doing for myself and I want to go to God. 
And I promise you this, if you turn from wherever you're going and you take that first step to God, he'll take every other step because he will run to meet you where you are. I want to close by just telling you a story about my family. I got a front row seat to watch my brother and my sister-in-law um, adopt a little baby. They have three girls of their own and they just adopted a little baby. I think we got a picture. We'll put it up on the screen of them. There they are. Come on. That's my brother. He, you see how he's bald? Like, it's, it's coming. <laughs> Those are his three older girls and that's Miller Jane that my sister-in-law's holding. I told you I pastored a church on the west side. One of my church members came up to them one of the first days they brought the, brought the baby to church and said to my brother, I can't, you can't make this stuff up, guys. Pastor Darrell, you got one in your church, I know it. She looks just like you. <laughs> Come on, Pastor Miles, represent diversity in the Peterson house. <laughs> she looks just like you. But I got a front row seat to watch this adoption process take place. They got three girls. Their youngest is, is eight. Their oldest is 13. Like, they got a full family. They just had something in their heart, and I know some of you have done that yourselves, that their family wasn't complete, that, that, that they had a heart to bring new life into their family of a child that maybe wasn't wanted. And I got to watch them go through the process. I got to watch them answer all the questions and do all the home interviews. I got called personally asking, you know, is my brother and my sister-in-law, are they good people? And, you know, like just, I got to watch them just jump through every hoop, you know. That's just the people doing their due diligence, making sure they're putting a, a kid in a good home. I got to watch them cut back on their spending because it ain't cheap. And she was worth it. And I got, to, I got to be on the receiving end of the phone call the day they got the phone call that there's a baby and she was born super premature. And then the caseworker said, and yeah, she's African American. And they said, we don't care, we want her. And I got to watch the joy on their faces when they brought her home and got to surround her and pray for her and just love on this child and just thank God that we're not the ones, uh, she's not the one that's blessed, we're the ones that are blessed to get to know her because God has an amazing plan for her life. And when I think about that, it just gave me a bigger picture of, of the heart of the Father, of the heart of God. And God's heart has always been and will always be adoption that he wants to bring every single person on this earth into the family. And if you're here in this place tonight and you know without a doubt that you are not in the family yet, God is looking down at you and saying, what are you waiting for? I want more sons, I want more daughters, I want more children in the family. And you don't have to run from me anymore, you can run to me. I'm ready to receive you with my arms open wide. So we just want to give you an opportunity to come into the family right now. If you would, bow your head and close your eyes with me. The presence of God is in this place. I always love doing this at my church, and it's really simple. You know that's you because something on the inside of you is just going on right now. Something unexplainable. That is the Holy Spirit that is drawing you to God saying this is what you have been missing your entire life. You have been trying to build your own kingdom and God's got a better kingdom. You've been pursuing your own dream and God's got a better dream. You've been going after things that you thought could satisfy you and God's the only one that can. And in your heart, if you want Jesus in your life, if you want to come into the family of God, you just call on the name of Jesus and say yes for the forgiveness of your sins, for him to make you new right now right now there ain't no perfect prayer God's here in your heart and if that's you in this place with nobody looking around I'm just going to count to three and ask you to put your hand in the air and signifying what's happening in your heart 
Come on, on the count of three. One, two, three. Anybody in this room today saying yes to Jesus? Come on. Come on, keep it high in the air. Keep it high in the air. Nobody looking around. And if you raised your hand, would you do me a favor? Would you lock eyes with me? Would you just lock eyes with me? Come on, yes. That he loves you. Brought you here tonight to tell you how much he loves you. He wants you in the family you're in. Come on, look right here, man. Yeah, let's go. That he loves you. Yeah. From the beginning of the world, he's thought about you. He has a plan for your life. It starts today. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Journey family, look at me. The Bible says, when one sinner repents of their sin and turns to God, wait for it, that all of heaven throws a party. I don't know if you know what a party looks like in heaven, but it's loud. It's loud. It's all celebrating Jesus for who he is and what he's doing in people's lives, raising people from death to life, bringing people out of hopelessness and putting them into the hope of the world. And so what we're going to try to do is do our best to join in and match the celebration of heaven and then we are going to worship our guts out singing this God that we are going to build our lives on you and for some of y'all in this place for the very first time you're going to be able to sing these words God I'm building my life on you I was building it for myself but now I'm building it on you I'm not looking back I'm running after you you're running after me and there's nothing better than being in the arms of Jesus come on there's nothing better than being in the family of God. Come on. Heaven just got a little more crowded. Jesus is going to have to make some more houses. Because come on, we got more brothers, more sisters, more children of God. Come on, give God your best shout of praise in this place. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, we're going to build our lives on Jesus and nothing else. And nothing else. Let's worship Him.